want to be when you grow up? Does anybody, has anybody ever asked you that question? I mean, when you were a kid or if you're still a kid, does anybody ask that question of children anymore? Like, what do you want to be when you grow up? I remember being asked that. Um, in an attempt to be funny, I sometimes say, I want to be five foot three when I grow up. <laughs> it was an attempt. I said it right off the bat. It was just an attempt. Uh, what do you want to be? What do you want to be when you grow up? Now, I, I wonder if that question has somehow along the way been replaced with what do you want to do? You know, what do you want to do with your life rather than what do you want to be in life? Um, having served in a church that was right across the street from a major university for about 16 and a half years, um, I saw a lot of students who were really struggling with this question, you know, what do I want to do? I mean, they come into my office and they have that kind of glazed look in their eyes, you know? Like, I picked this major, and my parents are really on board with this major, and now I'm not really sure this is what I want to do. I don't know what I want to do with my life. I don't, want to, I don't know what I want to do in life. And so this morning, I'm, I'm asking you the question, what do you want to be in life? Who do you want to be in this world? This is the question that uh, oftentimes we forget to ask ourselves in the busyness of doing. Um, when we talk about and we think about what it is that we want to be, I think all of us would say that we, we certainly want to be blessed, right? We, we want to be blessed in this life. We want to feel like we are blessed. But what does it mean to be blessed? What does that mean? Is that a word that we just kind of throw around without a lot of thought to what we're saying when we say it? When someone says, hi, how are you? And we say, blessed, how are you? Do, do we mean that? Because I, I think a lot of people do when they say it. I, I know people that say that and I believe that they mean it. And I've heard people say, I'm blessed and I know their circumstances. And the world might describe them as anything but blessed. And yet, that's their answer. I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that when we hear the word blessed, what we often think of is fortunate or lucky or um, having a lot uh, being successful, uh, maybe that um, this word has possibly been hijacked by our culture today, and that when we say blessed, we mean I have everything I want, and everything's going the way that I want it to go. And, and don't get me wrong, that's one way to look at it. Certainly in the Old Testament, God promised blessings to people, and even to generations and generations to come, and by that, God meant they were about to get a lot of stuff. I mean, like land, and they were going to have health, and things were going to go really well. So I'm not saying that can't be one of the ways that we see ourselves as blessed, that we have the things we need, and things are going the way we need them to go. It's not wrong to say that in that we feel blessed. I think we get ourselves into a lot of trouble, particularly in the church, when we can only say either or and not and. Sometimes, listen, sometimes it's an and. We can be blessed when things are going well and we can feel and be blessed when our circumstances are not going the way that we want them to go. This morning we're going to be looking at the New Testament book of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 1 through 12, a passage that is referred to as the Beatitudes. One of my um, favorite passages in the Bible, they're simply stated, but they're very profound in their meaning. They guide us, they point, they teach, and listen to this, they show us the values that Christ cares about most. They show us the values that Christ cares about most. They're not tasks that we can do and check them off of some list that we've made somewhere along the line. Um, they are actually heart habits that mark the core of our being. Heart habits that mark the core of our being. They're defining characteristics. The Beatitudes are the attitudes that we are to be. So um, Jesus lived out these attitudes in his own life and set the example for us. Our church mission statement is to help people look to Jesus so that we can live like Jesus. And so understanding these attitudes, these beatitudes, is important for us. Um, these values, if they're followed, they can bring people such a, a peace, a state of peace and a state of happiness, even when our circumstances are not what we hope for and not what we want them to be. They can also bring us right into the kingdom of God after our journey on this earth is over. Um, the Beatitudes are a series of blessings from a spiritual perspective. So we need to be really clear about this. 
because it can get confusing when we look at the Beatitudes. Spiritual perspective. So if you have your Bibles with you this morning, or you want to look it up um, on your Bible app on your phone, the scripture's found in the New Testament book of Matthew, chapter 5, and we'll be looking at verses 1 through 12. If you do not have your Bibles with you, um, the words will be um, on the screen. Before I begin reading this, um, I want to invite you to pay attention to the fact of, of the implications of now and future because we've sometimes made mistakes in saying this is all about the future and doesn't have any word for us in the right now. And so I want you to notice as you listen and as you read along that this passage is one that speaks to our right now hope and our future hope as well. So I'm going to invite you to stand as we listen and as we receive um, the word of God. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak, and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad. For your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Let's pray together. Gracious and loving God, as we look at your word today, we ask that you would speak to us in new and profound ways. That we would better understand this passage and what it means for the way we are to live our lives and the very way that we are to be. For we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. So when Robert, Nana, and I first started visiting San Antonio, we knew that there was a really good possibility, in fact, probability, that we would be moving here and living here for a while, hopefully a long while. And so we wanted to see everything. We wanted to know everything about San Antonio. We wanted to know everything about University United Methodist Church. And so um, we started kind of plotting out what we would go and see. We visited, of course, the Riverwalk. And, uh, and then we went to the Chinese Tea Gardens and we, we saw all the missions in San Antonio. But we were not able to do that in one visit. We had to revisit San Antonio to really go to all these. And we, we've been here now almost three and a half years. And there are still places that we want to go see and experience. There's so much about San Antonio and the surrounding area to do and to see and to experience. We can't, there's no possible way you could do all of it in one visit. And so it is with this sermon. <laughs> So it is with this passage. This is really a passage that should be an eight-week sermon series. It really should, because there's so much intricacy in these Beatitudes for us to understand, and yet we just have this one Sunday morning to do it. And a couple of weeks ago, someone posted on my Facebook wall a song by Brad Paisley, and when I clicked on it and listened to it, uh, the, the, the title of the song was Long Sermon. And so I clicked on it and I listened. And the gist of the song is, um, there's nothing that will test your faith more than a long sermon on a pretty Sunday. <laughs> and I didn't really know if that was a joke, but I think it's a little overcast outside today. So, uh, and Adam Hamilton once said that uh, people tell him all the time he preaches too fast and he tells them just listen faster. So listen quickly today. Uh, because we're going to look at this, but I want to implore you to come back to this on your own. I, I want to really encourage you to study this. Um, come back to this passage. Look at it deeply. Read a book or two uh, about this. J. Ellsworth Callis has a great book about the Beatitudes. If you want a really quick read, that, like an hour to an hour and a half, there's a book titled Hero of Heroes that really digs into the Beatitudes. I would invite you to, you can get that on Kindle for like 99 cents. And so... Um, Go dig into this, come back to this, because today we're just going to barely touch on those Beatitudes. And the main thing we want to learn today and hear from God today is what it really means to be blessed 
And, and what is Jesus talking about? What is he talking about when he says that blessed are the people who are poor in spirit and the people who mourn and the people who are persecuted. What is he talking about? That flies in the face of everything we believe to be true. It's completely anti-cultural in our world. So let's look, be, begin by looking at exactly what it is that a beatitude means. It means a sense or a state of blessedness a place of blessedness. In the Armenian church and in the Russian Orthodox church, people could even speak of another person's beatitude, their state uh, of blessedness. How blessed are you? And in the day when Jesus was teaching this, it had a divine and powerful meaning to the people to be fortunate, to be happy, uh, and to be blessed with these inward qualities, inward qualities. So while speaking of this kind of blessedness, um, each one of these pronouncements also has a future reward that happens with it. So let's look at a, just a few of these and talk about them and then look at what that means for us to be blessed. Jesus begins this uh, Sermon on the Mount. So if you read all of this chapter, Jesus begins the Sermon on the Mount with the Beatitudes and he begins by saying, blessed are the poor in spirit. Again, kind of flies in the face of what we believe to be true. And we might, we might just get stuck on that word poor you know, blessed are the poor. And, and in our world, we think that isn't true. Well, I wanna tell you this again is not an either or, it is an and. I have been on so many mission trips in my life and I have worked with people who lived in deep poverty and I have seen a blessedness in their lives that was enviable. So it can happen, but that's really not what Jesus is talking about here. Jesus is talking about people who are poor in spirit. And what that means is blessed are people who are aware of their own need for God. Blessed are you when you recognize that you can't do this on your own. That, you, that your salvation comes by the grace of God through Jesus Christ and you can't do it on your own. It is a gift to you from God. In Ephesians um, chapter two, verse eight, the scripture says this, for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. By grace, and that's not from yourselves. It is a gift to you from God so that no one may boast. And we live, we continue to live with the understanding that we can't live out these attributes in our own strength. We are poor in spirit. We need God and we always will, always. It's not a one-time need for God. It's not a one-time save me God and then I'll never need you again. It is an ongoing lifelong process of recognizing and understanding our need for God, poor in spirit. And the future hope that comes in knowing that is that the eternal reward is the kingdom of heaven. Knowing and understanding your need for God so that you can have the attitude like we're looking at in the Beatitudes. What does Jesus mean when he says, blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted? Again, we don't necessarily think people who are in deep grief are, are necessarily the most blessed among us our hearts tend to go out to people who are grieving and, and we don't consider them blessed, but I will tell you that there are people I have seen who see the blessings in their grief. It doesn't remove their grief, but they see the blessings in that grief. Now, when I was talking to Blake's mom this week, um, when things were still pretty scary, she said, there's just been so many blessings Right there in the middle of that. So there's that and again. It happens when we mourn and we grieve, we can see God's blessings. But that's not what Jesus is talking about right here. This is a spiritual, a spiritual reflection. Jesus is talking about blessed are we when we mourn over the sin in our lives. When we mourn over our own sins when it breaks our heart, when we recognize the sin that's in our life, mourning over our sins, spiritual mourning starts and begins with mourning over our own sins. When the Old Testament prophet Isaiah came face to face with the holiness of God, his immediate response was to fall down on his face. 
to fall down on his face and mourn his own sin. And this is what he wrote. Woe to me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, for I have seen the holiness of God. When we encounter a holy God, we mourn over the sin in our lives. We mourn. We don't excuse it, try to hide it, try to get people to accept it. We, we don't say, well, that's, you know, that's just who I am. I just gossip a lot. I just get angry and hurt people. That's just me. We don't do that. We mourn over that. And like Isaiah, we don't simply mourn over our own sin. We don't simply say, I am a person of unclean lips. We mourn over the sin in our world. When we look around the world that we live in, we mourn over the sin that we see in it. And more and more and more, it's right there in our faces. Isaiah says, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Our hearts should break over the things that break the heart of God. Our hearts should break over the sin in this world. Last week, you were given the opportunity to turn in an estimate uh, or an invitation uh, to giving card. And I, I told you, if you had already turned one in or if you were a visitor with us, um, to write a prayer on that card, on the outside of that envelope. And I got to sit down this week and read every single one of those prayers. Every single one. Many of them were brief and, and, and very profound and others were a little longer. But after the 11 o'clock service last Sunday, a young girl came up to me and she handed me her envelope. And she said, this is the prayer that I wrote. And I didn't get to put it in the basket because I wasn't done yet when they passed it. I want to share this young girl's prayer with you today. Dear God, I pray this church will continue to grow and do amazing things for not only our community but the world. I pray that everyone will grow to make the right, good, and kind decisions that will fill their hearts and others' hearts with joy and warmth. I pray that people will find God in their hearts, even if they feel he isn't present. They will search for him and love him. I pray that everyone, dot, 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 everyone, feels loved by someone. I pray that everyone will be content and love themselves, God, and others. I pray that the conflicts in this world will be resolved and that Jesus will take the guns out of everyone's hands. I pray that every thief, murderer, and criminal will realize their sins and pray to God. I hope they become new people, disciples, and that they worship God. I pray this world become a happier and calmer place and everyone in distress will come to you, God. And this I pray in your name. Amen. Our hearts should break for the sin in our world and for the people who do not know God. And the scriptures say that when we weep over our sin, the promise is that we will be comforted. The comfort comes in the forgiveness the comfort comes in the forgiveness. Then Jesus says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the land. Blessed are the meek. And in our world, translated, meekness equals weakness, right? That's how we see that. I mean, there's even an old joke that says, the meek shall inherit the earth, if that's okay with everybody else. And that's, we think that's funny because deep down inside, we really do believe that if we're meek, that must mean that we're somehow weak. But I want you to understand the definition really of meekness. A meek person is defined as someone who has a humble and gentle attitude toward others based on a true estimate of themselves. Based on a true estimate of themselves. Many of us don't have a true estimate of ourselves, do we? Not really. I mean, I know I clearly do not. Um, sometimes when I look in the mirror, I'm like, nope, don't look like that. That's not what's really happening. <laughs> I don't, and, but inside, inwardly, do we have a true estimate of, of who we are? I tried to say this saying a couple of weeks ago in both sermons. In both sermons, I messed it up. I'm going to get it right this morning. Arrogance is the only disease that makes everybody sick except the person who has it. Got it right that time. We need to have a true estimate of ourselves and of who we are, and it will create a gentle attitude and a thoughtful attitude toward others. Meek people are people who are tough and tender. They are people who are bold, but their boldness is, is, is with humility. If, if we are meek, 
We don't care so much about what other people think of us. We don't even care so much about what we think of ourselves. What we really care most about is what does God think of us? Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the land. The scriptures go on in, this, in the Beatitudes to talk about all the things that create in us an attitude that reflects the attitude of Christ. To be people who hunger and thirst for the righteousness of God. For Christians, righteousness is not just a matter of doing the right thing and checking it off the list just because we've done the right thing. For Christians, for us as disciples of Jesus Christ, doing the right thing is because we do it as an act of worship toward our creator God. We, we hunger and we thirst for righteousness. Hunger and thirst for that kind of living. And we show mercy. The more we show mercy, the more we receive mercy. It's so reciprocal, it just keeps going. The more you think about the mercy that's been shown to you, the more you should want that mercy to pour out from you toward others. Divinely happy and fortunate and blessed are the pure in heart. And I'm gonna tell you that this is the one that really could use a sermon or two or three or 20, um, considering the world that we are living in today. When I talk about this, some of you will probably disagree with what I have to say, and you're welcome to email me and have a conversation about it. Just don't be mean. Um, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. There are things that we see and indulge ourselves in in this life that literally blind us to God. They blind us to God and God's presence in our lives. For the past couple of weeks, I've been reading both sides of the argument, both sides of the debate on a movie that was released this weekend that is grossing millions and millions of dollars. And I, I did, in, in trying to be as fair as I knew how to be, looked at both sides of the argument. And I, I cannot walk away, I cannot turn um, my mind away from the idea that when we indulge our minds and our eyes and our spirits in that which is sinful and breaks the heart of God, it blinds our ability to see God. And, um, and I have actually, in just looking and reading some of the things and reading about how it was targeted, the movie was targeted during primetime television when children are particularly watching and even shows that are known um, that children watch, um, there's no other way for me to describe that except that it really is heartbreaking to me. It really is. Uh, but that's not the only thing. And I know there's lots of arguments. You'll say, well, people watch this. and people." You're absolutely right when you argue that. Um, but if we're living in a world um, where sin is glorified and sexual violence and abuse are entertaining to us, that will blind us to God. And please hear me when I say to you that when we expose and entertain ourselves with impurity, we're sacrificing our awareness and our knowledge of the highest goodness, the fullest majesty, and the greatest love anyone has ever experienced. So please, just don't be fooled. You're paying a far higher price than you think. When we allow ourselves to just dip into those places of impurity. The scriptures say that the reward for a pure heart is that you will see God. You will see God. Divinely, divinely happy and fortunate are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Now, I don't think this means that we're to try on our own to stop every thing that happens in this world that it doesn't resemble peace, but it does mean that in our own hearts there is a sense of peace. And there's no, the opposite of that is a sense of, of having a destructive heart, a heart of destruction. And, and I think we've all known people that, that are that way, and we've probably been that way ourselves a time or two, where it doesn't bother us that our hearts are in destruction mode of another person or a situation or a church. Um, we, we become destructive when we speak some of the words that we speak and act in some of the ways that we act. And the scriptures tell us that blessed are the peacemakers, the people who have a, a sense of peace in their own hearts that they don't need to tear down and destroy others. Blessed are the peacemakers. Um, blessed are you as a peacemaker. Um, 
And all of these things that Jesus talks about, he tells the people that he's teaching, you do these things, and there are gonna be people that aren't happy about it. <laughs> there are gonna be people who are real unhappy about it. And you may even, and you will, he doesn't say you may, you will even face persecution over standing up for what you know is right and speaking the words of Christ into a world that's turned very much away from that. Jesus was persecuted. The prophets were persecuted. So why would it be any different for us? But Jesus said, you'll be blessed in that. You will. You'll be blessed in that. So bottom line, this is what I I hope that you hear today, that an invitation to really dig deeply into these Beatitudes because we just don't have the time um, to do it deeply. Dig into this. Look at what it means specifically in your own life. Where are the areas of attitude that really need adjusting in your own life? Because all of us are gonna find something in here, in our hearts and in our lives that needs some adjusting. I'm pretty certain So know that you have an invitation to to read more about this. Because Beatitudes make one thing very painfully clear, and it's we can never be happy when we live self-centered lives. True happiness and real blessing comes in that relationship with our creator God. So in conclusion, know this, you are blessed. You are. No matter the current circumstances in your life, you are blessed, and here's why. You're blessed because you are loved by the God who created you. And you are are blessed with the promises that come from that same God, the God who created you. You are blessed because your sins can be forgiven. You are blessed because of the grace of Jesus Christ and the mercy that he has shown you. So it isn't a matter of, are we blessed if we're getting all the things that we want and everything's going our way and we're not blessed if they aren't? We are blessed in this situation and in this situation. You are blessed because you are loved by the God who created you. You are blessed because you are saved by the grace of Jesus Christ. You are blessed. Let's pray together. God, thank you in this moment for the blessings that you pour out upon our lives. Help us to understand that that doesn't always mean what we think it means. And help us, God, to see the blessings in in the times in our lives when the circumstances um, don't line up with what we would consider to be blessings. Help us to see, God, and understand that because of your great love for us, We're never alone. We're never alone. You are always one step ahead of us and you are always beside us. And Lord God, help us to see what a massive blessing that is. We pray all these things in Jesus' name, amen.